Hey everybody, Russ Barkley here, back with another video for you, this time on the risk that ADHD poses for use and abuse of nicotine. Well, it's fall here in Richmond and I'm wearing my flannels again, so get used to it. All right, in this uh, particular video, we're going to talk about a very serious problem that ADHD poses for individuals and what might be done about it, and that is the risk for nicotine use uh, among both teens and adults with ADHD. The first thing I want to talk about here is a research paper that illustrates this particular risk. This is a large study published in the Journal of Attention Disorders that involved 18,000 twins in Sweden who were aged 20 to 45, and they looked at the odds that ADHD symptoms posed for various substance use disorders, among them nicotine. And what they found is that ADHD increases the odds of nicotine risk by about 30% or more over the risk to other individuals who are not ADHD. The risk of multiple drug use was even higher, about two and a half times higher, and the risk for alcohol dependence, which we've known about previously, was nearly four times greater in those with ADHD symptoms and disorder than in those without it. So a very important study that uh, just reinforces what we have known for decades, and that is that ADHD in children and adults predisposes towards substance use and abuse, in this case, nicotine. Now, we're going to move on and take a look at another study that was published a couple years later. This is a study by my friend John Mitchell and many other colleagues who I know. It's a very good study that involves following up the children who were in the multimodal treatment study of ADHD. I don't have time to go into that study, but they followed a very large sample of children with ADHD, repeatedly assess them at various time points between childhood and adulthood, and then did their final evaluation of these kids at about 25 years of age. Now, these children were exposed to various treatments in childhood, uh, but then were released and followed over time for uh, the next 10 to 15 years or longer. So we're not going to go into the details of that study, as I said, but it's a very large study. It's very well done, carefully selected children followed into adulthood, very much like my Milwaukee longitudinal study, except using an even bigger sample than we had available for our assessment. There were 469 children in the study with ADHD and there were 240 children from the local community who were typical children. What did they find in this study? They found that in adulthood, the ADHD group had higher rates of daily cigarette use, had made one or more attempts to quit, often unsuccessfully, had shorter times during the day to when they felt they needed their first cigarette of the day and had more severe withdrawal than did the kids in the normal, typical control groups who also may have had cigarette exposure. So the ADHD group did not appear to have better smoking cessation rates despite a higher proportion of them attempting to quit at least once. So smoking quantity and nicotine dependence did not differ between the groups uh, in that sense, but what they did find is that the ADHD group reported starting earlier in the day, uh, starting younger with the onset of their smoking, progressing faster in their smoking, and eventually getting to higher rates of smoking uh, or tobacco use. Um, so they found that ADHD symptom severity in late adolescence and adulthood was associated with higher risk for daily smoking across all of the assessment periods in the sample. So their conclusion is that ADHD is associated with earlier onset of smoking, more rapid progression of smoking, more resistance to cessation uh, attempts by adulthood. And therefore, they are recommending that there be not only more research on this issue, but better attempts to treat nicotine dependence and use in people with ADHD 
than might be needed for the general population who's trying to quit because the ADHD symptoms are making it harder for individuals to quit successfully. So very important finding. It has been shown in many other longitudinal studies. I chose this one because of its very large sample size and the likely robustness of its findings. I want to show you another study here that may help to understand why this might be happening. This is a study that was in the journal Neuropsychopharmacology. It was published in 2019. It took 61 ADHD young adults who were not smokers, compared them to 75 control young adults, also not smokers. These people were between ages 18 and 25, and intentionally exposed them two doses of nicotine intranasally, that is using a sort of uh, nicotine spray, if you will. And then they monitored the plasma levels of nicotine in these individuals. So you're taking nicotine naive individuals, ADHD and controls, exposing them to nicotine to see what happens. They found that ADHD participants reported significantly greater dizziness episodes following the nicotine exposure, but also greater pleasurable subjective effects from the nicotine compared to the non-ADHD non-smokers who were exposed. They then found that subsequently, when given the opportunity to self-administer the nicotine, those with ADHD had significantly greater frequencies of re-exposure, that is self-administration uh, of the nicotine, than did the non-ADHD individual. So this shows that there's something about ADHD that makes the individual much more susceptible to the effects of the nicotine, particularly the pleasurable effects of the nicotine, than might be seen in typical individuals. So I think that's very important here. It isn't just being ADHD. There's something going with ADHD that makes this substance more pleasurable. Finally, to help you better understand these relationships, let's take a look at a very large study of genetics of ADHD and nicotine dependence. This one was published over in the journal Neuropsychiatric Genetics, was published in 2021. It's a huge study that involved thousands of individuals in which they did complete genome sequencing of these individuals, were able to then go in and calculate the polygenic risk score, that is how many genes individuals had for ADHD how many genes they had for nicotine dependence, and then look at the overlap of the genetics of these two disorders. And what they found is that there was a significant correlation between the genes for ADHD and the genes for nicotine dependence, correlation of about 0.53 in the study, which is large uh, when we think about the usual correlation seen in uh, other genetic studies. They also found that there was some relationship between the genes for nicotine dependence and depression and nicotine dependence and schizophrenia. That, that's not relevant to what we're talking about here. But what this does show is that the genetics of ADHD also, to some extent, are the genetics of nicotine dependence. Using this large sample, they were able to determine, was it ADHD that was causing the nicotine dependence, or is it the underlying shared genetics that creates the risk for both disorders? And the answer is the last explanation. They did not find evidence of a causal relationship from genetic liability for ADHD over to nicotine dependence. What they found was a shared genetic liability for both disorders, suggesting that genes for ADHD are affecting the brain in certain ways that make individuals, as we saw, more susceptible to the exposure to nicotine. And similarly, the genes for ADHD are also creating susceptibility to nicotine dependence. So shared genetic overlap, pretty substantial here, explaining why 
people with ADHD as they grow up are so much more susceptible to early starting of nicotine use, to rapid progression of such use, to higher rates of daily use, to earlier onset of the need for cigarettes during the daytime, and much greater difficulties quitting with the use of uh, various cessation programs, not as successful as other individuals. So what can we conclude from all of this? Let's get the PowerPoint teed up here on nicotine and ADHD. What are the implications here? Number one, families with children with ADHD need to be alerted to these risks, admonish their children about these risks and their greater susceptibility to nicotine addiction and monitor their children's potential exposures when they are both in and outside the home in the community to tobacco and then intervening to try to stop either exposure or the progression to tobacco use where possible that may even involve disrupting peer groups that are known to influence substance exposure by adolescents. So we want to make sure that these kids hopefully are not hanging around with other individuals who are more likely to be using these substances and through peer pressure, encouraging experimentation with those substances. Second, adults with ADHD need to be advised about these risks and understand that their disorder brings with it a very strong possibility of becoming nicotine dependent if they are exposed to nicotine. So their risk isn't that of the general population. It's magnified by their disorder when it comes to risk for nicotine use and dependence. So adults need to be advised about this who have ADHD, and then they needed to be provided with even greater intervention assistance in helping with their cessation. And that includes the use of ADHD medications to help manage the ADHD symptoms because we know that the more severe the ADHD symptoms are, the greater the likelihood that nicotine dependence is going to develop. Uh, and therefore, we need to do more to help manage that ADHD. In addition, providing adjunct medications that help with smoking, withdrawal, and tobacco cessation. Uh, and those can be drugs like bupropion, to some extent perhaps atomoxetine or other norepinephrine drugs that are known to help manage withdrawal symptoms when people go through cessation attempts. And then, of course, provided <clears throat> with more of the psychological and psychosocial treatments we use for smoking cessation programs. Lastly, primary care providers as well as mental health providers need to be made much more aware of these risks, because I think right now, many primary care people do not associate ADHD with risk for this kind of use, dependence and abuse of nicotine, and therefore may not be alert to screening for ADHD among those who come in and want smoking cessation programs, or to screening for smoking problems among people they see who have a diagnosis of ADHD. Uh, and then again, also educated about the need for greater intervention efforts in helping these adults to quit use of nicotine where that has become problematic for them. So I hope you found this video to be useful to you uh, and that uh, you find the information on this channel also be to be a value to you. If you do, please recommend the channel to others. And if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe to this channel. Thanks so much, everybody, and I hope you found this video to be very helpful to you. Take care and be well.